Hey everyone, um, I'm Joe Arnold from SwiftStack. Um, Timur Alperoch, also from SwiftStack. And we're gonna talk about hybrid cloud storage with OpenStack Swift. So we're gonna get into like the motivation of why we started getting more involved with doing hybrid cloud deployments. Then we're gonna dive into a deep dive into how it works and all the mechanisms, and then go over the uh, you know some of the use cases to to talk about some of that. So let's get started. So first off, the, what, are, what are people looking to do? Um, we're seeing that people need to store a bunch of data on premises, but then they also want to use some of that data in a public cloud environment. And so what's in the public cloud? You have different services that people, um, that applications can use to process data, whether that's computing, uh, bursting out for compute jobs. Um, there's all sorts of data services in things like media and life sciences used for data processing. Um, uh, a lot of times people are building applications in the public cloud where they may not feel comfortable running that application on their premises with the data center infrastructure that they have. So they find they want to deploy that application to run it as a service. They want to synchronize some data to distribute the data out in the public cloud. Um, or kind of more, not necessarily mundane, but just have a second, sort, second site for their data. And so our thinking about this was how can we have uh, the data that's in uh, an OpenStack Swift cluster be on premises and in the public cloud and be able to synchronize those two so that you could have the same data in both places. So that's sort of the motivation. Now, from a, like a pra real practical uh, consideration is we, we, we found that people couldn't move all of their data, even if they wanted to be in the public cloud, they had a hard time moving it all at once. So lifting something up, shifting 100% of the stuff out into the public cloud was just kind of untenable because you'd have a lot of data to move and moving data is, there's a certain gravity to the data that they have and so moving that all at once was really hard to do. Um, or you had a situation where the data wasn't necessarily generated outside of the system, it was generated with all the equipment, like the, the list of logos that we just showed, the uh, sequencing machines, cameras, uh, scanners, uh, uh, sensor data, all that stuff is being generated on that network, so might as well store it on there. You don't get the additional transit cost. Um, but kind of the biggest issue was the complexity of trying to change everything all at once. How do you do something in an incremental way? How can you have an application suite that's running on premises, part of a workflow that's already established, that's been um, ongoing, but then pick up some part of that that might be compute intensive and then bring it up. So that's, that's sort of the motivation. Um, then we started looking at what people were doing in order to move the data out. And there's, there's kind of two approaches. Uh, one was they were either using tools that would copy the data, like a, some client tool to move the data, but then you're subject to bandwidth limitations of that individual workstation or client to move the data. Or they were taking a, a, a gateway or using a, uh, some of the NAS products to move some of that data into the public cloud. But the downside there was you couldn't see the data in the public cloud because it's not represented as a native object format. So we were thinking, okay, how do we take uh, the data and store it in an, an, an Amazon environment or a Google environment in its native format? So when you actually go look at that bucket, it, you can see your data and it's not something else. Um, and then that what allows us to do is take those workflows that are on premises that see that data and then they can have access to that data as they're building the application to use for more cloud native applications that they're building. And uh, so then what we're gonna dive into here is uh, how, we, how we go and do that. And so what that enables is uh, first is a, is a second start a second site archive for the data. So being able to say, hey, here's some set of data that's on premises and I want to replicate that data to the public cloud. And whether I'm going to just let it sit there and archive it, or I want to have a second site for maybe content redistribution or sharing that content with other users. Um, or the, the middle option there, which is elastic hybrid cloud compute so taking advantage of workflows that can 
spin up beyond the compute capacity that you might have on premises, so bursting that out, um, or finally uh, doing large data set collaboration where think of like uh, we work with organizations that have multi terabyte data sets that they want to share. How can we do that where they're not necessarily exposing that on from their own network and synchronizing that data up to a public cloud so then they could they could share that with other org other folks that, uh, that they're working with. So when we started building this out, we we thought about different ways that people would want to move data between the two environments. So there's sort of like more fundamental profiles that we thought about. So one is sync. So keeping two namespaces synchronized with each other. So having the on-premises sync either one way or two way. So an update happens in one and it synchronizes in the other. The other is move, where data is put in one location and then moved. Again, this sounds pretty basic, so, but these are, the, these are the, like the building blocks right, that we have to work with. Move the data from one site to another. Um, or more, starting to get more sophisticated is access. How can we have an understanding of the public cloud and the on-premises data so we can make a request, and then that request says, oh, the data isn't on-premises. Let's, let's make that request in the public cloud and then fetch the data. Or if the application's in the public cloud and the data's on premises, how do we do the reverse? So we can make requests in the public cloud and then as needed, make the request and pull the data in. So those are the building blocks that we're gonna go through over the next few minutes here. Great, so we're just gonna kind of dive in a little bit into uh, the architectural overview of what we're trying to uh, pitch and build. Uh, so at the high level, it's what Joe just described. Uh, we have applications and users who envision on both sides of this diagram. So we have someone um, who could be accessing this from Swift on-premises, and we could also have users and applications running uh, in Amazon S3. It could be Google uh, Cloud Storage. That's the two providers we looked at so far, or it could be something else. Uh, one of our goals, is, uh, as highlighted in this diagram, was we need to uh, have native objects on both sides. So we're trying to stay away from kind of the existing model of uh, having the gateway where you have to run this gateway in the public cloud, and that's the only way you're gonna reach in and get, get at your data. We want to preserve the native format so that you can leverage EMR or whatever existing workflows exist in Amazon or Google or whatever else they're gonna roll out. Uh, so as part of this, I'm just going to go through kind of uh, the, at the high level, how do we handle different operations? Uh, I'll go through get, uh, puts and deletes, and we'll talk about some of the challenges there. <clears throat> uh, so when we have um, an application or users in the cloud trying to request some data, uh, Joe alluded to this notion of access. Uh, so some data may be on-premises and not available in the cloud immediately. What we envision is having a Swiss stack uh, access node is what we're calling it, which is a piece of software that's running in, uh, in this case, in Amazon. And this is a, essentially is a data router. So when the request comes into uh, this node, it will redirect the request on-premises, realizing that, hey, there's, this object does not exist in S3 right now. Um, then when the request returns, we'll place it in S3, and we'll also return it to the, uh, to the caller. And then subsequent requests can be made against S3 directly. Uh, and this also enables you to run any additional pipelines uh, at a way that's gonna be a bit faster. You're not gonna be paying for additional um, uh, latency uh, penalties in uh, processing any of this data that's already been fetched in. Yeah, we wanted to do this in a way that made it so that the data that actually ended up into a public cloud bucket was still accessible and it was still in the same namespace. So you could actually go and use so if you're using the S3 API on the on-premises, you could still get, use the S3 API in the public cloud, but you wouldn't necessarily always need to go through that access layer. You can actually go directly to, the, uh, to S3 itself to get the data. Right, and the thrust of it is that you may not want to forklift all of your data on-premises and place it into the cloud. I mean, that's kind of the original problems we're trying to get around. So this allows you to on-demand pull in some of the assets that you're gonna be processing. Uh, then uh, when a similar situation arises, let's say you've run your pipeline, you have created some assets in S3, now you're actually trying to pull them down and access them. Um, when uh, that request comes in, we're gonna propagate that request against the public cloud storage. Um, same scenario, the request comes back, we're gonna place it onto Swift uh, so that in 
in the subsequent cases, we don't have to go to the public cloud anymore. Uh, so the kind of the high level, that's uh, our way of trying to handle gets. Uh, they're pretty similar between uh, public and on-premises implementation. Mm -hmm. uh, the more complicated case is when we start talking about puts and deletes, and we're going to get into some of the uh, override circumstances as well. Uh, so in this diagram, you, uh, we're trying to uh, place an object into Swift on-premises. Uh, we're introducing a new notion, or the kind of the, the way we call this product is Cloud Sync. Uh, this is a process that runs on your container nodes. And uh, the uh, whole purpose of this uh, daemon or process is to asynchronously propagate any changes you're making in Swift into public clouds. So in this case, for example, we're propagating the single put into S3 and uh, Google, but we're not doing this inline. So these are uh, async uh, processes that are basically going to be running in the background, catching up to um, the state of your uh, Swift cluster. Uh, the slight detour here is I wanted to actually dive into how this works and how this uh, uh, cloud sync process uh, operates on Swift. How does it figure out, okay, which objects do I need to propagate? Uh, so the specific thing we're trying to leverage is the Swift container databases. Uh, each container database uh, is represented as a table. It has um, not all the uh, columns, I think, that are in the uh, table, but most of them, at least the ones we care about. Uh, so, for example, if you're placing a bunch of objects into your store, you may also delete some of them. Swift will record in a SQLite database the name of the object, the last modified date, and it also keeps uh, a flag uh, telling you whether this object has been deleted uh, as essentially a tombstone that it can propagate across all the container nodes. We can leverage this information because each uh, object name is, is going to be unique uh, in the database. So we're not going to have, for example, photo1.jpg appear multiple times in this container database. And uh, we also have an additional guarantee from Swift, where each entry in this database uh, is going to be um, in chronological order as far as this node is concerned. Uh, so if there are additional updates, we can continue reading after, for example, in this case, ID 44, and we will pick up any new changes in this particular container. Uh, so let's kind of walk through how this works and how this cloud sync daemon leverages this. Uh, so for example, uh, we will uh, place a new photo into our, our Swift uh, cluster. We have this database that has uh, the currently rows 42 and 43. We have some photos in there. It's great. Um, the new photo shows up. It's added to the container database. It's there. It's uh, row 44. The cloud sync daemon makes a request to the container database asking them, hey, I, I've got everything up to row 43, but what am I missing? Like, what, are there any updates after this? Uh, so at this point, uh, row 44 is returned to the Cloud Sync daemon. It knows that this is a new object. I need to go propagate it. And the Cloud Sync daemon will place it into, in this case, Google Cloud Storage. Could be Amazon or another S3 compatible uh, cloud. Uh, now, similarly, uh, if you'd make a put in a public cloud, we actually would, would want to walk through what is happening um, on that side and how can we propagate these updates back into Swift. Uh, obviously, we can't reach into Amazon and ask them for any sort of equivalent of a container database that we'll be crawling. Uh, they probably wouldn't be super amenable to that. Um, same with Google. Uh, but luckily, they have primitives that we can leverage uh, that allow us to uh, perform kind of similar tricks. All right, so, so there, there isn't a need to have a, any bit of infrastructure in the public cloud in order to do the synchronization from the public cloud back right. to an on-premise environment. Right, so importantly, we're not going to be uh, adding additional software that needs to be running uh, in Amazon or in Google. We're leveraging only the primitives that are already available uh, out of the box in all of these clouds and the, that you're free to use today. I, mean, I think the other kind of non-intuitive thing about this is that means that the on-premises storage doesn't necessarily need to expose a, a, a public route to itself. And because we were, we're making the request to the publicly available services in, in the public cloud. Yeah, so you still have this uh, nice separation where your Swift cluster does not need to be exposed to any sort of uh, internet uh, access. Um, the in entirety of this model works as a pull out of this cloud or a push to it. Uh, nothing in the public cloud is actually reaching into your on-premises storage. Uh, so to kind of walk through uh, this example, um, we have um, 
a put operation. Uh, we're going to be uploading image one because I'm not super creative with names. And uh, this uh, image one place is placed in S3. We're co we've configured our S3 bucket for uh, essentially issuing notifications into the simple queuing service. That's the SQS uh, component. And that will include, okay, there was a put, and here's the object name. And at this point, uh, our cloud sync daemon can interrogate the simple queuing service and ask it for, hey, um, what, what do you have uh, currently? What are the operations that have been um, done uh, so far on this bucket? Once it gets back the list of operations, uh, it can um, go on and perform all of the updates. Um, I wanted to highlight also how this works uh, in the same world, but with Google. Uh, turns out it's mostly the same, uh, but the icons are different. So <laughs> Google's thing is called Google Cloud Storage, uh, not surprising. Uh, the other icon is their pub sub service. It turns out it works pretty much exactly the same as the Amazon simple queuing service, maybe not super surprising. Uh, at which point our cloud sync daemon can uh, talk to the pub sub service and ask the same question, get back the same answer, and operate on the return result. So then, okay, how do we deal with the case where there's, multi I mean, the cluster is not just a single node on premises, there's multiple container servers that are running in the system. How do we deal with having multiple instances of those that are all being updated at the same time? Right. We, we need to tackle the problem of overrides and eventual consistency and how do we make sure that we don't have stale data propagated ad nauseum everywhere or that you actually get the results you expect. Uh, so I'm going to start by talking about um, eventual consistency just uh, from the side of propagating data from Swift and into our public cloud. Um, in this case, is three, but could be something else. Uh, so imagine we're, uh, we're going to put an object of version 2 um, into our bucket, and we're going to write this object of that correct version into S3, and everything's awesome. Uh, but at some point, uh, another instance of this cloud sync daemon is running as another container node, and these two container nodes don't, do not have to be in sync with each other at all times. That's kind of one of the nice properties of Swift. Uh, you have this high availability, awesome system, uh, which may occasionally give you stale results. Uh, we've engineered our cloud sync daemons to not be cognizant of each other's existence. So they don't actually introduce any single point of coordination. Uh, they don't talk to each other to synchronize, okay, we um, need to make sure that this is the right version. So at this point, you might actually get a stale uh, object placed into S3 as the prior version of this thing may show up on another container node, and this is propagated into the bucket, and they, this daemon thinks it's doing the right thing, and it's pretty great. And it seems like a bad situation to be in, um, but unfortunately, Swift helps us. Uh, so eventually, Swift will actually communicate between these nodes and propagate the update of the container database from one node uh, to another, at which point this new version of the object would ma will make it into the updated container database. And I'd like to circle back to the discussion of container databases where each object only appears once. So when this update happens, there's a new row appended and that row will have the name of this object, and it will have the uh, correct e tag and uh, modified date. And at which point, Cloud Sync Daemon will say, oh, hey, this is a new row. I have not processed this yet. Let me go copy this over to S3, uh, rectifying the staleness of the data in the public cloud. I mean, the other, the other attribute of this design is, is like we, I was alluding to earlier, where you have the whole cluster participating in the synchronization. And typically, in the deployments that we have, that means lots and lots of nodes all pushing data at the same time, so you can reduce the time that it takes to get the data that you want synchronized up into the, to the public cloud. So much so that we've been, you know, we have to start thinking about how do we put limiters in the system to um, not use so much uh, bandwidth in the system. Yeah, it turns out people don't want you to be clogging uh, the, their internet connection with your updates to S3 all the time. <clears throat> uh, so the, uh, the other scenario I want to talk about is uh, propagating data from uh, S3 and into Swift. We can run into similar issues here. Um, luckily, we can uh, rely on uh, one of the cool features in Swift uh, called uh, X timestamp headers. And this is a way for us to essentially propagate uh, an object's date uh, back into Swift when we're copying the object out of S3. Uh, so for example, if in, in Amazon we have this object, it's got a timestamp of January 1st of this year, uh, we'll find the object, we'll copy it over, we'll use the X timestamp header and we'll uh, set its date, even though this action might be happening in the future. So let's say it happened um, yesterday. 
Um, if at some point you're placing another object into the system, Swift will also assign it a timestamp, and that will be the timestamp from the operation when it actually completed. Uh, this way we can ensure that these um, stale objects from S3, which may come in with a new timestamp otherwise in Swift, will not actually cause you to have stale data in your Swift cluster. Uh, so as uh, the updates are propagated, Swift will uh, update the uh, container and the object node with the new object that you've just placed, and you're saved from kind of having these stale objects from S3 living on forever, thinking that these, these are the latest versions of everything. Uh, and the last one is dealing with overwrites in the public cloud itself. Uh, so of course you could go into your S3 bucket, take your um, object, and overwrite it a bunch of times, and somehow we're gonna have to figure out what's the latest version. Uh, and it turns out when you go to S3 and you've done the overwrites a few times, you're not always guaranteed to get the latest, last version of this object. Um, turns out we can leverage bucket versioning, which is another feature that Amazon allows you to enable by default. And <clears throat> what it allows us to do is if we had image one uh, in S3 and we overwrote it, when an SQS notification happens, it will include the version um, that is actually in, in this bucket. So now when we're querying SQS, asking it, hey, uh, what are the updates that I've been missing? And it will tell you there's a put and there's also the version of this object. Now when we're inter interacting with S3 and we ask it for, uh, okay, I want image one, but this specific version, you may get a 404 back because that's how eventual consistency will manifest itself at this point. But you're not going to get back a prior version of the object. That's the guarantee that you get back uh, from Amazon in this case. So you could retry and eventually get the correct version, hopefully. Um, turns out overwrites with Google are super easy because they're strongly consistent on overwrites, so that was very cool to engineer. <laughs> uh, and the last bit I want to talk about, which uh, is maybe the least fleshed out, but also it's something that we're tackling as we're kind of moving along. Joe alluded to three use cases that we have. Archiving, cloud bursting, or elastic uh, mm -hmm. compute in the cloud, and collaboration. Um, when we're thinking about these workloads, we're also thinking about, uh, we, we need to somehow express notions of uh, policies or rules to our containers and objects in them. And how do we map these policies, which could be numerous, uh, to these use cases? So uh, luckily, it turns out for the three use cases we have, there's only a small set of policies we need to express. Uh, one, uh, for uh, the uh, cloud version collaboration, we're gonna have to propagate deletes uh, from Swift into the remote cloud, or the other way around. Uh, for example, imagine a case where uh, you want to share a file, let's say I want to share an object with Joe, um, it's pretty great, and then I realize that was a bad idea, and I need to go get rid of it. Uh, not propagating that delete into the bucket would allow Joe and whoever he gave the temp URL access to to continue to download it forever. Um, for cloud bursting, it's kind of a similar thing. Uh, and in both cases, you may want to set an expiration time when you're actually propagating these objects uh, to other clouds. So that's why we need the uh, expire objects at destination policy. And for archive, it, in some ways, it's one of the easier policies where we only need to expire objects locally. And at that point, we will consider objects um, to live on forever in the cloud. Sorry. Um, and then I think just last few slides here, just drilling into a few of the use cases. Um, so second site, and this is having an, a public cloud archive for on-premises data. And this is enabling the ability to just set up the, 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 the profile, um, set that to um, a bucket or a container, and then synchronize that data to either something like a Google Nearline or a cold line, or into AWS 3, or have that tear off into, into a glacier, glacier product. And then the system just behind the scenes, whatever data gets placed into that, uh, into that bucket, it synchronizes it over. Um, and it's nice because um, it doesn't require any additional software up in the public cloud to, uh, to peer into that. It's just there in the native, in the native format. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is uh, c customers that have a compute intensive job on premises that they need to, to burst out. So um, we've been working with, um, uh, like the Cisco CTO group has put together a, a Dockerized workflow with, uh, with SwiftStack. And when people are creating lots of Docker containers to run a job, 
oftentimes it's really hard to manage a, um, an, an amount point that needs to be distributed across lots of those containers. So it's pretty natural to use an object API to get data and put data into the system for persistence. And that means that they can use available resources on premises to run that job. And if they need more capacity, they can run that same workflow in the public cloud, yet still see the data that they might need for processing. Um, and then on collaboration with data, data sets, uh, we have a, a nice uh, user interface for folks to have access to the data so they can see what data is in the system and manage that. Um, and then that can allow them to set ACLs so they can do some of that uh, some of the collaboration on their local environment, or if they're synchronizing that data out into the public cloud, then they can have access to, um, uh, access to it there. And you know, industries we're seeing that where you have these large data sets, things like media files for, that might be used for data processing or collaboration or life sciences data, which are large data sets, um, we're seeing them synchronize that data up for, for those use cases. So, and then just finally, we'll be happy to take any questions, but um, we encourage you to, to try it out. Um, uh, we have a, go to swissstack.com uh, slash test drive, and you can play with it yourself. It's all self-service in terms of getting up and running. Um, but thank you, happy to take any questions. No. Um, are, you, are you doing anything with, um, so if, if you have a big multi-tenant self-service um, OpenStack cloud, how do you deal with credentials and things to S3 or something? Um, so mo I would say most of our customers will, um, will, be, will be using things like Actor Directory or LDAP typically to deploy in their environment. We do have a Keystone inter inter integration for access locally, but in terms of um, needing to bring credentials in, um, they'll go to a like an IAM. Uh, they'll need to create the credentials in the public cloud and then bring them into the into the management tool to 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 put the, that information in there. And anything the, else to add? <clears throat> well, I think there's uh, one other uh, thing that I think you were trying to get at, which is uh, how do we propagate the credentials from like oh, a public right. cloud, sure. right? Like yeah. like an S3 uh, bucket access or uh, Google Cloud, or whatever it is, uh, and how do you resolve the mismatch, right? Because like, you may have access to Swift, but it's not clear that you have access to uh, either one of these. Uh, so right now, um, we are allowing um, administrators to create uh, kind of storage profiles that is essentially, here's my Amazon credentials. Uh, and right now, it's administrator-driven, so they would create the mapping between, okay, this account can sync to this bucket, for example. Uh, we're envisioning where, um, at some point, we could allow also consumers, uh, like the users of this cluster, uh, to also say, hey, um, I have a token for uh, kind of these credentials, and I'd like to sync this container using uh, this token, so we can at least uh, kind of map their request to the actual S3 credentials um, and validate that this is proper, and they're allowed to do that. Yeah, that's a good point, though. But, but today, what, we're do what we do is we have the operator provision the credentialing information and then give, you know, give that a profile that the end users can use. Yep. That's how we do it. Uh, for this hybrid scenario when you sync data back and forth between on-prem and public cloud, uh, do you see customers kind of trying not to get there because of the egress costs of taking the idea out of public cloud to on-prem? Uh, so the question is, do you see people not wanting to egress data? Yeah, because of the because of cost. cost of figures. Well, and, and uh, there's also, so Direct Connects also have helped with that with, with customers. Egress cost, yeah. Yeah, with, with particularly on the egress cross point. But there, you know, you start seeing customers that have very large storage footprints yeah. in the public cloud in, in S3, and it starts making financial sense to bring a portion of that on premises that might not be in active use by data processing or being served actively. So we do, we do see, see that as a use case. So they actually do archive on-prem? Yeah, for, for, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and I think one of the other things to consider is that for certain workloads, uh, you'll see the result of the computation to be much smaller than the input size, yeah. in which case uh, your egress cost is going to be much more compared to your ingress, which some doesn't charge you for. OK, thanks. So just a curiosity for the uh, use case. For registry, so 
could uh, perhaps could we make the uh, registry to uh, push to the local endpoint and uh, expect to push the public cloud and uh, some something like the function uh, or lambda uh, to pull out the container to deploy <laughs> in the public cloud. Do you think exactly like Timur does? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Uh, We've actually talked about Lambda, and I think it'd be pretty cool to do some of these things where we don't have to run uh, a piece of software in, uh, in Amazon or in Google itself. Um, we've, I've only thought about it as far as thinking about it, not actually doing it, but I think that's something to explore. That would be pretty cool. Right, so the I mean, basically, uh, on the first slide that Timur gave, it's like, if you're in the public cloud and you want to have access to your on-premises data, and you want that to route automatically, you need to hit a dedicated endpoint. So can we take that same code and implement that as a Lambda function in, in an AWS environment? And then it just turns on requests. Yeah, yeah. another question. So uh, if my on-prem applications are, say, legacy applications, which does not understand object protocol, they still speak in file-level protocols, then how do I use this thing where I sync data with public cloud where on the public cloud my application understands it in object format and on-prem it understands the same data in file format? Yeah, that's a really good question and uh, I'd love to talk about that, but I want to talk about that later. Okay. All right, thanks for sticking with us. Oh, oh, one more, thanks. Sorry. Uh, so how do you deal with encryption, encryption keys? Are you doing oh, server question. side or client side or both? And how are you handling encryption keys in different environments and locally? And right, so <clears throat> Swift supports encryption at rest uh, when you're storing data in your Swift cluster. Uh, we can, uh, like for the purposes of actually making this useful, when we will transfer data from your Swift cluster into, uh, let's say, S3, uh, Having that data encrypted with the Swift keys is not going to be useful for any applications aside from maybe archival or DR kind of situation. Uh, so we will do decryption at that point. And then you can configure encryption keys on your S3 bucket and use the Amazon style policies on that. At least that's as far as we've thought about it. One more? Hopefully this is the last one, but... Uh... Um, I think you know one of the slides you showed where two sites are trying to push the same object uh, in the context of eventual consistency, right? But uh, you know, won't it unnecessarily you know increase the cost for the customer? Yeah, it's a it's a good question, right? So, I mean, those, that's a corner case that we have to deal with, and, and I think we're just we're demonstrating that we can do the resolution in an uncoordinated way when those corner cases happen. Not that we expect to be the that's the standard case. Um, and because we, if we didn't show that, then somebody else would have come up and gone, hey, when did you, how do you deal with this situation? Um, so that's a good question, though. But yeah, we do partition the workloads, though, yeah. so that when you do have multiple cloud sync demons running at the same time, but they're not actually all chugging on the same uh, parts of the database at the same time. Uh, we will do some mod arithmetic to essentially split up the total number of rows into workload per daemon. Since they don't talk to each other, you may have a situation where two of them will upload the same object because, uh, let's say the object is large, uh, one of these starts uploading, the other one checks if the object exists and it doesn't, and we'll try to upload again. But that's more of an edge case versus how the system is designed to work in the common case. All right, thanks for joining us this evening. Thanks so much. Thank you.